keep hold your number steady. Don't just bid higher because you know the the broker is saying that they're getting a higher bid, and you know you think that that guy might be smarter than you. You know, stand your ground and then tell the broker, say, hey, if anything falls through with this guy, give me a call. We're, we like this product. This is the number we're at. And uh, we've gotten a, quite a few deals like that where they come back around. This is episode number two, three of the Multifamily Success Stories podcast. Would you like to turn vacant units into cash and earn up to three times more per door without having to do any extra work yourself? We offer fully managed short-term rental solutions for multifamily investors. Go to managebylux.com for more information. Hey, this is John Bell. And Julian Sage. And welcome to the Multifamily Success Stories podcast. This is a show where we talk to multifamily investors about their journeys and starting and growing their real estate empires. Our goal is that you'll be able to walk away not only inspired, but with practical information to help you in your real estate journey. Since we are a new show, please go over to iTunes and leave us a review and let us know what you enjoy. And if you haven't done so already, go on over to our Facebook group, the Multifamily Success Network to connect with the community. Hey, what is going on, Dealmakers? Julian here. Today, I had the special honor of speaking with Maureen Miles, the co-founder of 4M Capital REI, a uh, vertically integrated multifamily syndication company based in Atlanta, Georgia, that has $125 million of assets under management and about 1,850 doors in their portfolio. In this episode, Maureen shares her experience of starting out flipping duplexes to become financially independent, but achieving that financial independence just after her second multifamily deal, uh, how she's been able to successfully vertically integrate her company, uh, including to her property management business, and why she's actually transitioning over to real estate development as opposed to just strictly value add. If you like my show notes for this episode, go to multifsuccess.com backslash EP23. Or if you like my show notes sent directly to your inbox every week, then go to multifsuccess.com backslash show notes. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Hey, welcome back, dealmakers, to another episode of Multifamily Success Stories. In this episode, we have the special honor of speaking with Maureen Miles from 4M Capital uh, REI. Uh, Maureen, would you please introduce yourself to the dealmaker community, let them know who you are and what inspired you to get into multifamily investing? Hi, uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, so um, what inspired me to get in, into multifamily investing is I come from, I have an IT background. I was a network engineer for many years and uh, just my husband had a job that didn't have a great retirement. And so we kind of started just by building a retirement uh, kind of nest egg for ourselves. We started buying some smaller properties. Uh, I'm from Connecticut. That's where we started buying them um, back in uh, 06. And it kind of grew. Um, we didn't have money when we started either. It was uh, it was just small kind of sweat equity. At that time, they'd let you buy for pretty much signing on the dotted line in 06, right? But we were paying high prices. Uh, so in 08, the kind of the recession came. Uh, we kept all our properties because we bought for cash flow. We were smart enough to do that. And um, I started looking at how to use other investors' money because we were tapped out. We had a lot of money into renovations. And I, when I say money, I mean like credit cards, basically. We we're flipping and trying to do uh, these projects on credit cards. So we got stuck for a little while. Luckily, we were able to, to keep everything rolling. But uh, I started attending, looking for seminars and things on raising private capital because I had people coming out of the woodwork just saying, hey, can I, um, you know, if you need help with a property, I'd love to get into it with you. They had money, but I had now the expertise. I had built that over a few years on renovating, leasing, uh, improving properties overall. And I... Uh, I started learning how to work with investor money because I was afraid of taking somebody's money and then not like not realizing that I didn't even know what I didn't know. Uh, so I wanted to do everything legally and make sure it was uh, correct. So um, I went and looked for those kind of seminars. And on that journey, I came across syndication with how you put 100 plus unit properties together. And uh, I didn't feel right going down that road until I actually left my corporate job. 
So uh, yeah, just 2013, a package came out and I was really frustrated with my job. I said, you, you know, it's time to look for a change. And so I remember driving down the highway and thinking, okay, if a car comes in front of me, like I'm not going to swerve. Like that's how I was going to work. Like I'm not swerving. So I, my job was, it, it was getting pretty brutal. Um, so yeah, I left my job in 2013 and uh, jumped off the cliff and tried to figure it out. It took about a year before we took down our first large property and that was in Atlanta. Uh, and so that's my story of how I got to where I am. And I just realized I was good at it. Like, I'm I'm good at this. I enjoy it. I know all the aspects of it. And yeah, we just dominated it. So from 2006 to around 2013, you were focused primarily on uh, duplexes and, and kind of flipping properties that way? That's correct. So we would, um, I would look, there were some really good opportunities at that time as far as cash flow goes. So we'd purchase a property that needed help. Uh, if it had some kind of deferred maintenance or as I like to say, a property with the right things wrong with it. Uh, so I would look for that property, uh, purchase the property, we'd fix it up and then we would either uh, keep it and, you know, kind of use the cash flow. So we would keep it and run it or we would sell it just depending on how the project went and who, who I had involved with it. Can you, can you walk us through a typical deal uh, that you would see and how much you were able to cash flow? Were you, were you flipping these or were you turning them into long-term? Uh, for the the smaller ones, um, like the one particular deal, we would go in my and the, the numbers are so different now of where the market is. But I used to be able to it would cash flow fifty percent off the monthly income. So whatever the monthly income was, um, if it was if I was collecting two thousand a month, I could expect about a thousand dollars cash flow off that. That was in Connecticut and some of the smaller markets here and there, um, kind of in my own backyard. So you know I. People always think they have to go to Austin or, you know, they're looking in Atlanta or San Francisco or whatever, but man, your own backyard, especially if you're in one of these smaller areas, like there could be good opportunity that you just, you know, don't be afraid to take advantage of those opportunities. But yeah, that was, um, that was the time when I, yeah, I looked for 50% should be cash flow. And why, I mean, that, that's some pretty good cash flow. And I mean, you're doing it in your backyard. You know, it's relatively probably a small team, uh, you know, probably a lot more simpler than what you've built up now. Why not just keep on, you know, uh, chugging away and picking up more of those, you know, 50 percent profit margin properties instead of, you know, uh, what you eventually scaled into? No, and that, that's a great question. Um, what when I did that, I got to because I was working full time still. So I got to about uh, 30 units or so that I was holding myself. So I was running on myself. We renovated them ourselves uh, then. And I should say myself, this is with my family. My kids kind of grew up in this business. Even as teenagers, they were replacing pergo floors and apartments and painting window. They know how to replace windows when they're 16 years old. We race them against each other and stuff. So it was fun doing that with them. Uh, but when I, when I hit about 30 units of maintaining that, even with help from the family, I just, I, there was no more time in a day and we still didn't get to where we needed for me to really exit my job. Um, I had a decent job. I've made six figures. Um, and I used to work like I was in charge of Asia. So I'd work these off hours. So I do real estate during the day. I do that at night. And my goal was to eventually get out. Um, of that and have enough cash flow, but I just realized like I I would there's just not there wasn't enough time in a day and I couldn't find the right help in the area of Connecticut of where I was. Um, people had offered to help manage the properties, but I would drive by some of their portfolio and I'd be like, wow, these are ones that I'd be looking to buy and renovate. They looked they were terrible, and I was like, I don't want someone running the properties that run them like this. So I couldn't I couldn't find anybody to let that piece go to. Uh, so. Yeah, we. Uh, I just hit a wall. Like, so there wasn't enough time in the day. I couldn't get up to sixty or hundred units in my capabilities. Can people? Yes, absolutely. People can do it. Uh, I just wasn't able to find that mix. So, what I loved about the hundred unit plus is you have a dedicated team. So, for every hundred units, typically is the the ratio. You have one person inside, one person outside. So. You know, that's that's their their job. They get up in the morning, get dressed to go work at your property all day long and just pay attention to your property. So I realized that um, with that kind of third party management or that those people just dedicated to that, really, you can just rinse and repeat. And that's all it is. You just learn to manage them. I learned some tricks along the way and things that I had to keep an eye on and, you know, where, um, where potential uh, 
pitfalls were and stuff, but just once you get that kind of worked out and which I learned a lot on the, the smaller properties, the duplexes and the, the triplexes and stuff. Uh, so I kind of cut my teeth on those smaller ones, as I say, but once you make that uh, merge over to the larger ones, it, it actually becomes a lot easier and it is more lucrative. My husband was able to retire after our second deal, which was just three months after buying our first one. So it happens quick when you get the right properties. The, your, your husband was able to retire uh, from that one property deal from the, after that second property deal, you said after the second deal, yeah, just on the cash flow, we just, met other just, expenses. just off of those, those 200 plus unit properties. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you, you had spent, you know, at that point around what's, uh, seven, eight years, uh, doing duplexes and you were trying to replace your six figure income and you, you weren't able to do that with, with the, you said you had around uh, uh, 30 units. Yeah. At the max we were holding, I mean, we had flipped some along the way and things, but we were holding about 30 units. Yeah. And so, you know, 70, uh, you know, seven or eight years of doing that. And then just off of those first 200 plus deals, you were able to re replace a six figure income. Yeah. And off the first deal, I just had a small GP part. It, I had a couple of partners in there because you need for sponsorship, you know, you need liquidity, uh, net worth and uh, operations experience. So luckily I was able to come in with the operations experience, but I had two other partners in that deal. So I was only about 30% of it. And it was a smaller deal. It was 117 units. The next deal that we closed on about three months later was 250 units. And it was just me and one other partner at that time. And man, that sucker cash flowed. It was really good. And yeah, with just just my portion after paying investors really well, uh, just my portion. Yeah, it, it actually covered all of our bills, all of our everything. It was it was awesome. How? Because you know when you, when you when you look think about that, I mean, you have over thirty properties. Um, you're cash flowing around a thousand. You know, uh, you know, fifty percent profit margin there. I mean, it, that's. When you um, when you look at those numbers and you see you know it might be easier to maybe come up with a picture of like how much money you might be making per property how many properties you need when you get into multifamily though it's just like you said off of that second deal you were able to you know completely replace um, you know a, a primary income how how can you or how did you know like uh, that this property was going to be able to do so well um, as opposed to, you know, everything that you were doing uh, previously with the 30. So with the 30 units too, it wasn't 30 properties, just to, like I could have lived very well off 30,000 a month. So <laughs> just to clear that up. Yeah. So there's so a, a four family, it would, you know, maybe four units would, would provide that thousand dollars a month. There's an independent on what we bought it for and how much income it collected. So uh, and that was just, a, that was our target. So some may be 800 a month or something, but that was like, and that's really, that was at the bottom of the market too. So, you know, as we came out of, you know, 2009, 2010, venturing into 11, 12, 13, we weren't, those deals weren't so prevalent anymore. The prices have ridden. So it was, you know, the margins were getting smaller. Uh, but the way that I analyze the deal and the way my team analyzes the deals are that we look for, we're trying to meet certain investor expectations. So our investors, we know we could put a deal out there that's say an 8% preferred return. If we can hit 8% on it, we know we can fill that up. So sometimes our GP portion doesn't come until after we make some improvements or we do some of the value add pluses that we want to do. Back in those days, this is uh, 2014 um, when we bought those two deals. And uh, I mean, you know, we bought for uh, like twenty five thousand a door. We were paying for in Atlanta. Uh, that's what that we bought that second deal for was twenty five a door, and those rents were five and six hundred a unit. So that's another thing we like a high level way to just analyze is right now. I know I can get a deal to work if it's basically like a one, maybe like a I guess that'd be like a point zero one. But if it was um, if I'm buying something for a hundred thousand a door, and the rents are a thousand a month, that ratio, right? That would kind of the one percent that would kind of work. So these we were buying for twenty four thousand a door, and the rents were double. So the rents were five hundred dollars a month. So that will work all day long, and it did. It oozed out cash flow. Um, I think I was. I think at the time we were making about nine grand a month off just that second property on the GP side. That's after paying all investors, paying. You know, we had a split with investors on that deal. I think it was a 50-50 or maybe a 60-40. Uh, 
And uh, that was the GP side of it. So it's really worth figuring this out, you know, because you have, okay, 250 units. If you just look at that one deal, 250 units, that's, um, you know, like almost eight times my previous, the 30 units I was managing in Connecticut. Uh, but it's all in one place. And now I have somebody that sits right in the middle of it every day. You know, there are a team of people. We had three people inside on that property and two and a half people outside. So, you know, it, it's just, it's it was so much easier. So it actually frees you up to go look for the next one then. You're not worried about, um, you know, people used to make fun of me because I'd know some of the tenants' birthdays, like their kids' birthdays and stuff. But I would let, like, you know, it, you, you lose that connection with the tenants, which was probably a good thing. But um uh, you don't get so close to it. You just you run it more like a business than than kind of a hobby. I think some people get into this. They're just a little bored. So maybe they retired and they like kind of kicking around their multifamily for it's something to do. We run into those kind of um, sellers sometimes. Like they don't know what they'll do after they get rid of it. But, you know, in the most part, when you run it like a business, high level, it's it's the, the numbers really are better for the, the 100 plus units over the, um, you know, two to four unit. So. So after you made the shift into, um, you know, um, these these multifamily units, what um what were some of the biggest challenges that you saw shifting from, you know, um, doing duplexes and you know running your own smaller team versus uh, now you're collaborating with other investors and um, you know um, moving into just a, a different really diff- different as- asset class. Um, some of the things uh, to look out for was. Uh, I mean, one of the major things I found was uh, contractors. Now, I was pretty close to our renovations on the two to four. If I wasn't physically doing them myself with my family, you know, we called some people in. But for just very few things, if we were going to side it, I'm not a great person to do that or certain things I know where my skills are. Uh, So calling a, a contractor out to work on these, I think they see the commercial property and man, the prices were insane. Like I, so I had a hard time getting contractors to work with. So I'm like, listen, buddy, like that does not need to cost that much. And they would, especially being a female, I think they wouldn't know like that I knew what I was talking about necessarily. And so uh, I remember we had to replace these two rotten windows one time on a clubhouse, just the sill had some rot. It was painted, paint chipped away, some water got in there, not a big deal, but it just, it just looked kind of crappy. We want to take care of that stuff. So um, we had two bids come out. One came out for 30,000 and one came out for 60,000. And I'm like, I couldn't even imagine like what on earth, how could it be that much? So I wanted to meet the contractors to hear that. So met them out there. The first contractor tells me, uh, well, first of all, it was on a second story. So we had to go on the roof. And so I'm like, all right, who has the ladder? So I was up on the roof with them. Not a big deal, but again, I don't think they expected that. Uh, But so I'm on the roof with them. They said, well, you know, this, this sill is rotted. And they're like, we have to, we have to pull that apart. And he's like, we have to take it all the way down to the studs to see if there's any more damage. He's then we're gonna have to reside this whole upper layer. He's like, that's 30 grand. And so I was just listening and I was like, Hmm, that's interesting. Okay. And then the next guy came along and he said basically the same thing, but he's like, but we have to, we want the colors to match. So we're going to reside the bottom too. So that's why his was 60. And I'm looking at it. And now I had the second guy that I'm like, or I'm like, maybe we just pull the sill off and make sure there's no damage in there, but there's no leaks inside. So there, I don't doubt there was going to be any damage. So we could replace the sill. And I said, then we could wrap it with like coil, right? And uh, he says, oh yeah, but um, he goes, this, these bends would be hard to make, um, you know, the bends for the aluminum or the coil. And uh, I said, well, if you can get me a breakout here, I can show your guys how to bend it. Like, I don't mind. And I said, I think we could do it for like, 400 bucks, I'm thinking is what it should cost. And the, like the guy just like went away. We ended up, we ended up doing it for like, I think $600. We got the whole thing done and replaced. And it was just, so that was the biggest aha moment on with these properties, when you could bring the skills you learn with your two to four units, like I used to feel like, oh, I'm wasting my time. I wish I did this sooner and better. But man, those lessons I learned on what things should cost and how, you know, how to, um, manage tenants and stuff like that. It, it helped me on the the later half when I'm doing the hundred plus units. Now it's it's really the same thing. It's just bigger properties. So we're able to save a ton on contractor charges. So again, that was one of the biggest lessons I learned is they just see the big dollars and think, oh, it's a commercial property, so we can charge you know ten times what we should be charging. 
Um, so that was it. And then the other thing is just understanding how to work with a third party management company. It's a lot different, especially when you're hands on. Uh, so it's a, it was good for me to live in Connecticut and do this to Atlanta because it kept me away from the properties a little bit because I would be probably way too involved. Um, and so having to learn how to rely on your reports and your numbers. Um, I was still down there at least once a month checking on everything and watching that. But but that was another thing of just really learning how to decipher all the um, the financials every month and where certain things would go and how they could tuck certain things away or, um, you know, places that they would maybe hide delinquency or collections, like things that weren't obvious. So just learning about all those kind of tricks and things like that. So on those first couple of deals, did you uh, take on a big uh, value add or were you just kind of uh, trying to buy them at a B or C or what grade were those properties when you purchased them? Yeah, they were, I would say C plus. Um, they, the one we bought was, uh, I look at tiers. Uh, okay. So there's different buyers as tiers in the marketplace. So I think after a recession, you kind of have that level one buyer where they come in, you know, maybe the property is 50% occupied. It might be in receivership. Uh, there's life and safety issues is what they call like deferred maintenance, basically that that's important. So the life and safety issues. So you'll have companies come in. A lot of times they may buy it in a tape or a whole bunch of these properties at once. And they will, uh, you know, just really def- properties with tons of deferred maintenance. So they'll come in and they'll kind of bring it up to what I call like a financeable level, right? So they'll fix the windows, they'll fix the life safety issues, roofs need to be done, they'll do that kind of CapEx. And they just kind of get it to like a level two buyer. So a level two buyer was where we were operating in, where we were coming in and we would tweak the interior. So that's that's where you really make your rent bumps, in my opinion, are those interior upgrades. You need a decent exterior too, but you know, if I replace the windows, it's not really directly proportional to my rent increases. Overall, the property will be more secure and safe and happy. You know, people will be happier with noise and insulation. But m- the money is really made on putting a gooseneck faucet in or upgrading the flooring or changing out the appliances. That's where you can bump up your rent. So, again, that's like the level two buyer. They go in and um, kind of just like take it to the next level. So, you know, it's it's a safe and secure property, but it might be a little ugly right now or outdated. So we go in and clean that up. Then we sell we sell to like a yield. So level three buyers would be like a yield buyer. Uh, we're selling to somebody, we have that property operating, really tweaked and tuned in, and then we kind of sell it off like that. So now they know exactly what their return will be because they just have to keep running it. Or we would sell it with a little meat on the bone for a little while in this market a property with some units and a store, a units to be turned still and a story was almost worth more than like do you know, create or renovating them and upgrading those units. So we would try to leave at least 25% available to be upgraded still. So, you know, we were level two buyers, people that don't want the headaches would be a level three buyer. And when you get that super deal that has a lot of risk, that's like a level one buyer if that makes sense. (laughs) And that's totally, that's what we call it in our own house. That doesn't come from anywhere. It's just the way we look at it. And um, why you had those properties or why you started picking up those first two big properties, did you drop any of your smaller properties? I did. Um, Yes. As soon as I got that running, I realized that I could run probably three larger properties to the effort it would take certain ones. Um, certain maybe two or three pro- unit properties because as anyone does this know you have some that just for some reason they're just beautiful they just run great you get the great tenants in that don't leave and like to take care of the place and then man you get other properties that you just like sometimes there's just like the thing you could just never get the right like tenant to click with that property and you're constantly changing sometimes they're right next door to each other the properties you're like what is what is the deal so um yeah, that that uh, I forget your question. <laughs> I forget your question. I'm what, sorry. Um, so, so you you eventually did you eventually move into property management uh, from um, from these uh, syndications that you did? We did. So what happened when we when we got to around two thousand units? Uh, we just ran into some snags with some of the property management companies. So the owners of the management companies are always great and have the best intentions. 
And then the people that we would get as managers through them were good. We can get in and work with them. And they wanted to, you know, they treat the tenants right. They do a good job. It was like this middle layer that I would seem to butt heads with where the regionals, they would want to spend money on ridiculous things. And sometimes they would do it without approvals. Um, So that was definitely a line for me. Uh, And there's a few things that happened along the way. But I went through four property management companies before I just decided to, rather than uh, kind of butt heads with them constantly, uh, just to kind of push our own uh, processes and procedures down the way we wanted it done. So that's when we got into third party, uh, which was about three years ago, or I shouldn't say third party, but we, we became our own property management company. And what, um, what were some of the biggest challenges with, you know, beginning to vertically integrate? Um, did you see like a large drop in like, you know, um, uh, tenant satisfaction or a lot of people wanting to leave or was it a pretty smooth transition? Yeah. So, one of the reasons we did it as well is is it would frustrate me with the people. So I think the manage the managers on site that interact with your tenants, they'll make or break a, a property. So you could have a great property with like a bad manager in there. And man, that property will just go down and vice versa. You can have a borderline property that, you know, really needs help. You get a good manager in there, man, that thing just takes off. So what would frustrate me about working with the other groups is I didn't have control over the people because they were their employees. So I would just like I'd show up at a property and all of a sudden, whoever I was used to be in there, say Amy was the manager for the first year and a half is gone and they have some new guy in there. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, oh, we transferred her to another property that needed her skills. But I'm like, well, I need her skills and I really like Amy and what happened. So with having control over that myself, that was actually one of the biggest reasons, too, is uh, I could control the people and keep our team together. So. We only did it when we had a really good team of people that wanted to stay too, because as we transitioned to a different management company, when we like terminate one and go to the next one, our people were staying with us. They were staying with, you know, Maureen or whatever company I was working with at the time. Uh, So we had those followers. So there wasn't like a bunch of people that would jump ship. And usually they're pretty happy that we moved. Uh, now recently I actually, the one that we were just doing with just our in-house properties, we ended up shutting that one down. And I, I JV'd with someone that used to run over 10,000 units because one of the things we found is I could never, I always wanted to kind of get our processes and procedures down before taking on anybody else's properties. And I just, I never could feel that I could get that tuned all the way. I feel like we're always improving still and always had room for improvement. Uh, So I just did a JV over the COVID. This is one of the things we worked on during this COVID time of kind of tearing down the other company and rebuilding this new company with uh, like a co-CEO. And she, um, yeah, she's had 20 plus years experience in just property management. So she's leading the third party uh, pursuit. And then I I still keep control of my portfolio. Uh, But it's, because it's hard, it's hard to recreate the wheel. And so we just took all their uh, procedures and uh, processes, kind of tweaked them the way. And we're still working through some of that. But uh, that control, it's all about control, too. It's not really a money um, thing or a, an income stream. We just need control over the properties. Yes, from some of the other... Um... Uh, multifamily, vertically integrated multifamily investors that we talked to. Um, again, they, they said um, uh, the, the, there's not really that that much of a difference in profit when you, you know you end up having to pay for you know uh, payroll and all these other expenses and um, you know uh, it just it ends up adding up. You know the the amount of profit that you make is is pretty minuscule unless you're really starting to just focus on growing um, the the third party management. Is and is that what you're looking at and trying to do. And that's why you wanted to start doing third party. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to do it is because we're holding just about 2000 units right now. So we bought, we bought 1100 units in 2019 and sold 1400 or vice versa. We sold 1100 and bought 1400 units. But so we're just, we're maintaining right around the two 2000 mark, give or take a hundred units. So at that level, you, you don't have the ability to support, kind of the back end that you need. Like we do have executives, we do have, uh, or I should say assistants, and we have people to help with things, but we don't have somebody focused on marketing. We don't have, we didn't have accounting in-house. We didn't have, so there's there's still other people that could, 
or other companies, when we don't have control of those companies, they it's kind of like an unsure piece of this. It's something that we don't have control over. So what that did is it brought us, it gave us the ability to bring everything in house. So we have somebody dedicating to dedicated to reporting. So just that alone, I'm um, somebody that can track all the lender requirements and you know the due dates for your insurance upgrade, just these things that are just constantly, there's a million things like that out there. And so this gives us the ability to have that larger corporate team for my properties but then offer that to other people. So that's the reason we went third party is it gives us that structure. And I think there's about 14 corporate people now. We might be up to 16 now, uh, but it, it makes a huge difference in the way things run. You know, I, I see one of the entrepreneur dilemmas is, is that, you know, there, there's so many different options that you can do uh, when you get into multifamily. You know, you can become, you know, vertically integrated. You could do development. You can start doing all these things. And, you know, we'll, we'll touch on you going into development, um, you know, in a bit. But do you do you feel that how have you been able to handle as you are taking on more responsibilities that it's not diluting uh, what you're what you were you know primarily good at, which was, you know, the, you know, uh, renovating properties and, and just, you know, turning those for profit? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's the reason for like the third party management, because you start to get bogged down by lender inspections and or bogged down by uh, a plumbing issue that somebody can't figure out or I mean, just something weird. It, it constantly like comes up to you the more you respond to it. So as you get those layers in between there, you get that the experts at it because one person can't be an expert at everything, you know, and I enjoy certain parts of it. I really enjoy working with my investors. I enjoy the pursuit going after the properties and building those relationships with lenders and banks and like, and then being cre creative around our structures. We do a lot of different structures with our syndications. And I love that part of it is to think and say, okay, what do the investors really want here? And, or which, like, if I'm looking at a particular project, you know, who, what, what can, we kind of put investors into kind of like buckets, I call them, depending on their needs and their wants. It's like, okay, who would this project be really good for? And how can I like, like turn it and man, like, uh, manipulate the project so that it can be perfect for this investor and then figure out the way that we're going to structure that. So I love that aspect of it. And it's really getting somebody, all those things you hate to do, there's somebody out there that loves doing them like that <laughs> and finding that person and getting them in, in place. So uh it's just, it's really growing your team and having a great team that allows you to not get stuck in the weeds, which is something I, I like, I totally struggle with that all the time. Uh, I'll spend a day on stuff that I shouldn't be spending a day on. I have um, a gentleman that I hired, originally he started as an acquisitions guy, but I've made him a partner now. So he helps a lot when you have that kind of that analytical structure um, set up, you know, with me, I'm more a fire putter outer where so you need that teamwork and knowing what you're not the most efficient at or not the greatest at getting that right person to to help you and you know like one of one of the people that you said that you um uh that you started u utilizing a third party because they would manage somebody that uh does the marketing themselves correct um, well, we have a marketing in-house, but we didn't have that dedicated person. You know, we're relying on the property manager to put out Facebook ads and to update Craigslist and to negotiate with apartments.com, you know, as a, and then everything is a little different, right? So you have one property that's totally killing it on Facebook and you have another property that, uh, is just lagging or putting out, uh, just material that isn't that great. Uh, so it, it's just nice that when you have one person dedicated to that, somebody to watch, you know, we want to know where are the leads coming from? If we're spending money, are we spending it in the right uh, right place? But with everything going on, it's hard to stop and say, okay, this is the most important thing I'm going to look at right now, right? A lot of times those would kind of fall back to the bottom of the list because as long as occupancy is good, like there's something over here that probably needs to be tweaked. So we don't have to look at occupancy right now or that market, you know, lead generation, so it's nice to have somebody just dedicated to that, you know, putting out ads the way they're worded, things like that. So when you when you brought uh, when you bring another dedicated person, you know, in house that maybe you know I don't know your background in like marketing and, and advertising, but how you know are you having to create the processes for this person and start to manage them? Um, you know, isn't that not just adding like another layer of complexity onto your plate? Or how do you kind of handle as you're growing your team? 
um, how to be able to manage um, you know, those, those KPIs or those expectations that you're trying to reach when you do bring them in-house? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons I, I ended up doing a JV with, it's called Vicinia Living is the new company. I ended up doing a JV with uh, Kimra as my partner there. Uh, because she had these people that were already, they already knew these systems. Um, they already were trained in the process. They already worked great as a team. And the company that they were working with together ended up that they retired, they sold most of their portfolio. So they were, they were really um, disassembling the property management company. And it just, the timing was just perfect. And so I got somebody that I didn't have to train, you know, they, they already know what they have to do when they show up on Monday, you know, they, they know how to do it and how to rock it. And I just asked my questions I needed. If I need a different report than what they're used to, they'll create it for me. Or so I still can go after what I need to know, but they have their systems in, which has just been, it's, it is actually a huge weight off of my shoulders uh, instead of trying to find a new person and explaining marketing. And cause I'm not an expert at that either. That's not my skill set. So, uh, when when did you start to move into uh, property development? I was talking to a developer in uh, for about two and a half years now who who developed product, uh, but he was able to really cut costs. Um, and he actually is building. We like for a long time we used to hear and we even say they don't build workforce housing, uh, but this this gentleman actually does build work for workforce housing, and he was looking for help in his structure, because he's a builder, right? That's what he's good at. He was looking for a partner that could come in with the structures to assist in financing that can um, assist in being a sponsor for the deals and things like that. And we talked to them for about two years uh, before doing this, but now we're involved in two projects in Texas that we're building. One is uh, going to be 244 units and one is 320 units. So it's our first development, but uh, like I, I know the guy and I trust the guy now. So that's the biggest thing when you're looking for any kind of partners, it can't be about the money because you'll eventually get burned or something. It, it's gotta be that you, uh, it's about the people you work with good people and you know, good things will come out of it. Can you clarify what you mean by uh, workforce? Uh, workforce, we call that, um, you may want to call it like blue collar or gray collar. Uh, cause typically, you know, places are built as class A, right? We've heard class A. Uh, class A is brand new. They'll probably have granite countertops and they have to really put those bells and whistles in them to get the rent because of the price of land now and what it takes to build them. So a class, usually property start as a class A. They may age 10 or 15 years. They become a class B property. That's where your like gray collar, as they say, will do it. Maybe your nurses live there. You're um, kind of, they're not executives, but they're, uh, you know, maybe uh, supervisor roles and things like that. And then typically that property will age another 15, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, it becomes a C property, right? So that's where your blue collar people um, will move into and work out of and and rent. Uh, One of the things I learned early on through the smaller properties that I, you know, were buying and fixing um, I had one particular, it was a three family unit and I actually had three relatives living in the whole building. They could, they occupied the whole entire building. Were they, were they Italians? Um, they weren't actually, no, <laughs> they weren't. Uh, but it was like, a the, you know, the mom and two kids on the first floor, the uncle lived on the stair upstairs floor. And then like the grandmother lived on the first floor with like one of the other uncles or something. And they were out one day and I, I was down there and I was getting rent, whatever I was doing. And uh, I told them, you know, I, I guess I was just feeling generous, but I said, I said, you know, you guys can put your money together and you can like buy one of these and you're, you know, you could live for less rent. Cause I mean, I didn't tell them what I was making, but I remember I was making 1200 bucks off that three family a month. And so, you know, I said, you guys, your, your rent would actually go down or, you know, you'd have a mortgage and, and they just, they looked at me and they just, they sort of laugh and they go, Maureen, you're so crazy. They're like, we can't buy a house. And I'm thinking, you know, I told them like, no, you can, like, I, I know what you're, you're, you make for income. I have all their records. I know what their background is. And I'm like, no, you guys can. And they left like, well, you're nuts. And they just laughed it off. And so it, it, what that did though, is it made me realize that some people are just programmed to rent, right? They're not going to uh, save up their money and buy a house. There's some people that their grandparents rented, they rent, their kids are going to rent. So if you can keep those properties, you know, safe, uh, clean, you can respond to any kind of maintenance, uh, people, they're going to rent from somewhere. So they're, you know, there's renters out there that 
I'm not trying to put anybody down or anything, but I mean, they're just going to be renters for life. That's what they do. They rent. And so if you can get in that class B and class C, if you can get those properties just just functioning well, people don't leave. They don't, you know, unless they're like for a job change or something, but they're not all going to just rent till they buy a house. Like some of us may be thinking, you know, that's not the mindset. So one one of the things that you said was that, you know, after a period of time, the, uh, you said that kind of the class of the property will kind of just shift due to time uh, when you're trying to target, you know, maybe a, a B class property, uh, the lifespan on that, uh, from what you're saying is is a lot shorter. So how can you, you know, future proof yourself if you plan on holding this asset for a longer time? Or are you thinking more short term, just try to, you know, um, you know, um, uh, get in cheaply, and then eventually sell it off. And then somebody will take that from a C and then, you know, bump it back up to, you know, B plus, or something like that. Yeah, it could different projects have different, um, different uh, goals, right? So there are some that we buy specifically that we're going to turn in, say, three years, we're going to get in. And it, it really depends what what the property has when we're purchasing it or what what's wrong with it, basically, when we're purchasing it for those. Some will buy it and we're like, yeah, we're going to keep this thing long term. We got it at a really good basis. The area is continuing to grow. We feel like there's a lot of runway. So we may plan on ha- hanging on to that property for 10 years where other ones are shorter term. And, you know, it depends on the property, what's wrong. It's it's hard to keep like a 60s or 70s property long term. For us, it's like you kind of go in, you fix what you need to, you clean it up and go. When we get our hands on 80 pro- 80s properties and things like that, 80s, 90s, those are the ones we like to think about keeping longer term. Uh, they are less maintenance. You know, you have to worry about galvanized plumbing in the older properties. Uh, just things failing, subfloor issues, uh, you know, water, sewer lines, things like that. Some of these properties are like a never ending um, thing you have to deal with and you have to have money set aside for. And it's just it's just part of it. Like, you know, it going into it. But a lot of those properties, we wouldn't say, OK, we're going to keep this 1975 property for the next you know, 15 years where a 1995 property. Yeah, we could, you know, maybe plan on keeping that for 15 years, if that makes sense. But that's just our strategy. And, and what has been some of the challenges with, um, you know, moving into development? Actually, from a lot of the friends that I talked to, and, and I, you can interview me again in a year and we'll see, see how it is. But uh, they say that once you do development, that you'll never go back to your renovations because they said it's and there is there's an unknown. Every time we begin a renovation project, we do have money set aside for kind of unknown that's things that, um, you know, maybe there's a sewer line that needs to be replaced that you really, we didn't identify in the beginning um, or, you know, just something pops up that maybe we didn't see. So there's always that factor. You always want that cushion in your capital funds, right? So where with development, you know, you know what the dirt costs, you have estimates and you have contracts for what it takes to, um, to put all your uh, infrastructure in, then you know what, you know, there is variability with like, what's the price of a two by four right now? That's something that we're concerned with right at this moment. But there's not like, you're not going to open a wall and find something unexpected in there in a new build. It's more from my expectations are that it's going to be more process and procedure orientated and just keeping everybody on task. Uh, you know, weather could be a factor, I guess, but you're not running into these constant, um, I shouldn't say constant, but in in renovation, as anyone that renovates knows, there are things you run into that you can't always anticipate. Uh, So they say it's a lot better that way. And our goal is to be, we're running two projects right now, but our goal, I just want to work through these a little slower, but then our goal is to try to run six or eight of these builds at once. And what, what's the reason for the shift from, you know, what you had going on, what you you were good at to, you know, a, a new venture? The reason for it, so the, with the prices right now, they're so high that we're not able to have that same cushion when we buy. Um, I mean, the markets could still double over the next five years. I don't know. But our comfort level of going in with the value add, there's like, there's not a lot of meat on the bone right now. So, I mean, I'm seeing properties that are for sale that uh, pretty much my comfort zone, if it was fully renovated, would be at some of these numbers. Um, and again, I could just be too conservative, which is very possible. They may continue to rise. But with construction, if you buy the land right, you know what it's going to cost to build. We can get the infrastructure and the, you know, the um, 
the land development part down. And we know what our profit is expected to be. And conservatively, there, there, that's where there's actually money. So I'm in Nashville right now, um, and I'm seeing 1980 pro- 1980s properties selling for 165, 180 a door that you have to go in and debrass or take all the brass down without debrassing. But it's, uh, which I think is just crazy. And yeah, rents could end up being 5,000 a unit per month here one day, and those numbers may work out good. But to me, you can build for just a little more. We can build for 200 a door. So, you know, and then you'd have a brand new product with less maintenance. Uh, so anyway, that's that's the cause for the shift is I I do have a good pool of investors that I I like and they like me and they trust me. And I don't have product to give them enough right now, especially with the COVID stuff. There was a, such a slowdown. You know, another, I think there will be some fallout from this COVID too. I don't think it'll be a 2008, you know, off the cliff kind of leap. But I think in the next probably 12 to 18 months, we're going to see some, there's going to be a little bit of uh, stuff coming up. Uh, so there may be some opportunity again there. But right now, like, I don't want to be more aggressive in looking at the value add and pricing it. Uh, because that it's, I think it's for, for our comfort zone, my investors, it's just risky. So building is actually less risky. So that's the reason I'm doing it. And I could run multiple projects to keep uh, investors happy, to keep ourselves fed, our teams fed. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just the way to progress. And of course, building during these times might just be a little delayed. I mean, the, um, inspectors and things aren't necessarily running like clockwork like they would normally be. Have you experienced major delays because of COVID and just the offices not being open? Yeah. So we were actually supposed to start closing on our first construction loan in March and we didn't do it because this was coming. And I was a little concerned. I said, I didn't want to have a construction loan out there with you have completion guarantees and deadlines for draws and stuff with those lenders. So I didn't want to get stuck totally freaking out that, yeah, everything shut down for, you know, I mean, even back then, 60 days, we thought was a lot. And now it's still running and it's, you know, December now. So one, so we did have a couple of renovation projects that uh, were reliant on getting a permit signed off on for HVAC and insulation. And we had a couple of buildings that we were uh, redoing the whole building, uh, renovating it. And so we ended up finding like an engineering company. So during this thing, what some of the cities allowed you to do is there's an engineering company that they would use an approved, off an approved list. And you'd be able to get that engineer to come out and stamp it, take the necessary pictures, and then you'd be able to move forward. But for a couple of projects, we were held up like a good 45 days, 60 days before we came to that conclusion or, you know, that, that um, way to solve that issue. So like right now we have a property that uh, a bridge loan, we should have been selling it right now. The goal is to have it on the market in September, Uh, but we're still stuck with eight units that we've been trying to get up and rebuild. And uh, they're still not done now because we had such a delay. So we're having to extend the loan another year and it's, it's, I mean, we're rolling with it. It's okay. We'll figure it out, but you're right. It has been with um with with multifamily i want to want to hear your opinion do you feel that because you're moving away from you know the value add because you said that you know it, you'd be spending just so much time and, the, and there's not as many deals out there there's probably still deals which is why people are still doing it but you're shifting your focus do you feel that because value add is maybe a lower barrier to entry and it's maybe maybe easier i would i don't know if it'd be easier but do you think that it's a lower barrier to entry than to development and that's why um you're seeing more opportunity in that space well that's a good question um so we did just close on something about um three weeks ago now uh, a value add so we are still buying i don't i don't want you to think we're getting away from it but we're like i said we we closed on 1400 units in 2019 and now this is we close on 120 units in 2020. So it's, you know, and again, we have a team that we func- that functions together and we have to pay and everything. So we're looking for an opportunity to keep everybody, uh, you know, firing on all cylinders. Uh, so I wouldn't say that the opportunity, you're, you're right, there are still opportunities. Um, value add, if there's a lower barrier to entry, yeah, there's definitely more people fighting for something in the value add space. Uh, we've bought very few marketed products to projects too over the years. Uh, we always like off market, like everybody does. But what I found with a marketed project is that if 
if you, you know, first of all, you get 12 people competing. I'm like, I always, this might sound a little cool crew but like there's always one idiot willing to pay too much and then if you win it you're like oh crap what did I miss like I'm I have it for higher than everybody else so we just avoid those now because it's it's uh it's brutal and you know you just you just never know a lot of times you know 1031 companies or something they'll come in or somebody with a 1031 they'll put offers out on you know four or five properties and then they'll get three and they'll end up closing with one but they went much higher on their offer because they have a different objective than returning money to investors like how we operate. They want to park money or just have it grow. So when you're competing against that buyer, uh, you can't always, you know, because so, people say, Maureen, they constantly are outbidding me on stuff. I'm like, well, yeah, because you're they're not buying for the reasons we're buying. So when you're competing against that in a bidding situation, you know, you really are paying too much probably if you win that, if that buyer, but a lot of times those buyers will exit out, they'll get, they'll get three LOIs accepted and then they'll end up actually only, you know, closing on the one. Um, and so those properties come up. So what I tell people too, if you're in a situation like that and you, you know, keep, hold your number steady, don't just bid higher because, you know, the, the broker is saying that they're getting a higher bid and, you know, you think that that guy might be smarter than you you know, stand your ground and then tell the broker, say, Hey, if anything falls through with this guy, give me a call. We're, we like this product. This is the number we're at. And uh, we've gotten a, quite a few deals like that where they come back around. So just some. And, and starting to wrap up here, if, if you could go back and start from scratch, what would you do differently? You know, I laugh sometimes because, uh, and uh, I love the brokers, so nothing against commercial real estate brokers whatsoever. They're awesome. But uh, in the beginning, I used to call it broker talk, where you walk into a multifamily uh, property. It's like, oh, like this would be so good if you take down these three walls in the kitchen. And like they come up with these crazy stories, like, you know how much money that would cost, but they would have these great ideas. And so I'm like, all oh, the broker talk, like they, you know, sell you the dream. And uh a broker one time, he told me, he's like, Maureen, this was in Atlanta, Cobb County, great county. And I think they wanted like 50 a door for these properties. I'm like, they're crazy. He goes, he goes, Maureen, he's a young guy. He's like, you should like, he goes, some other investors, he goes, they're like backing the truck up right now. And you should just buy everything you can. And I'm like, this guy's trying to make me buy all these properties, trying to sell. And man, I was just telling somebody yesterday, I'm like, I wish I listened to him <laughs> because he was right. You know, now those same properties are selling for like a buck 25 a door that I could have bought for 50 a door five or six years ago. So um, going back, I would know my, I would, I would probably be able to recognize the opportunity more. So I was you know, very conservative, very timid in the beginning, which is fine. It kept me safe. You know, we always say too, it's better to miss out an opportunity and live the fight another day than to, you know, make a misstep and blow up your chances of continuing this business, right? So um, that would be my thing is I would probably realize more so the opportunity and the spreads and how how valuable they are when you're in a market and you could really, you know, get that cash flow cranking. Uh, not, I should have been more aggressive in buying more. And, and, uh, last question here, do you, do you, um, are you implementing anything into your business or how you're doing development or value add, uh, with, uh, you know, everything that has happened with COVID more people working from home? Um, is, are, are you, are, is anything that is currently happening, changing how you are uh, moving forward? Yeah. So as, as far as the, on the development side, we looked at uh, kind of putting amenities into different use, like having different types of amenity space where, you know, before you wanted one big clubhouse, now maybe work centers, more business centers are more appropriate or smaller spaces outdoors where before, you know, you'd want a great outdoor space with a huge fire pit where now maybe you have some smaller areas with some bushes and, you know, outsiders where people can walk dogs and more paths like we're putting a path around um 14 acres of one of the properties we're doing and so that has kind of changed a little bit on what we're looking at for amenities uh and as far as the value add space uh we're just actually today we just refinanced one of the projects and um one of the value adds that we're going to do to that is um bring in like a google fiber uh and just have that wicked high-speed internet uh, that people can rely on from home. Um, these these units. That's the other thing is we're we're looking at 
you know, it's more, I think, preferred to have bigger units now. For a while, these units, especially as you get closer to downtowns, were just getting tinier and tinier. And, you know, making sure like, you know, we prefer a property with a balcony or some kind of out private outdoor space as opposed to just being locked in some little box, basically. Like, so those are the shifts that we're making is um, considering more people will be working from home and how we can uh, kind of help them do that and offer amenities that maybe other properties wouldn't be offering. Awesome. Well, what's what's the best way, Maureen, if anybody wants to be able to get in touch with you, if they want to find out more about uh, Valencia or uh, any of your investments, how can they get in touch? Yep. So it's uh, vicinialiving.com um, is the name of that uh, website. If you go there, there's a contact us and it's V-I-C-I-N-I-A living. Um, and then also uh, our website is the number four uh, MREI.com. So www.4MREI.com. Uh, and there's again a contact us there. But um, I'm always willing to, I don't know, just to help. And anybody in Atlanta or Indiana or Texas that wants to, it's always good to know who you're working with in the market too. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to to help um, out there. And yeah, just uh, keep doing it. A uh, real multifamily is awesome. It's, it's the way to grow for long term for sure. Uh, I, I don't think there's a legal way to make more, <laughs> make more money for longevity and really change not only your life, but generations to come. Like I, I've shifted generations of my family now by doing what I've been doing. That's awesome. I would love to be able to have you back on the show uh, to talk more about as you're progressing in your journey. Uh, of course, we'll include all the links down below uh, for you to be able to connect with uh, Maureen. And until next time, dealmakers, talk to you later. Take care. Thank you, guys. Hope you all enjoyed this episode. If you did, please go on over to iTunes and leave us a review as that greatly supports the show. And if you'd like to be able to connect with John, the community and I, then come and join us on our Facebook group, the Multifamily Success Network, where you can connect and make deals with other multifamily investors. Go to multifsuccess.com backslash community.